So uh, today is chapter seven, is that right? The intentional community. And uh, this is obviously very pertinent to what we're doing here because we have created an intentional community intentionally, hopefully with good intentions, <laughs> sometimes with a little bit of tired intentions, but always doing it for the welfare and benefit of as many people as we can, even though we didn't know who they might be. So I wanted to read just the first page of Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's introduction because it's really lovely and it differentiates two types of communities. So I thought I'd just read through the first couple of paragraphs. Uh, yes, page 105 to, um, to begin the discussion. So for anyone who is here for the first time, which at least a couple of you might be, I'm not sure about Frank, if you've been here before, um nice to see you no huh and uh Mukund, it's your first time although you've been to the uh day retreat so for anyone who is here for the first time this is less of a lecture and more of a discussion so we want to bring these teachings to life and invite everybody's reflections and invite your um yeah questions reflections the way you might consider that it could apply to your lives. Maybe you want to dig deeper into the meaning of a simile or whatever it is. I want to learn from you as much as I'm sure you want to learn from not only me, but each other. So please feel very free to raise your virtual hand. At the bottom of the screen, you should get a little uh, uh, sign or something with your virtual hand there. Um, and we'll unmute you. If you do ask a question, you will be recorded, but only your voice. So the video will always be pinned on us. So we take the, uh, we're the mug shots <laughs> and you're just the voices. So you're quite anonymous, but if you prefer not to uh, be recorded at all, then you can just write questions in the chat or comments in the chat. Okay. All right. Any, any questions or clarification needed? We'll just see how it goes. Yep. Oh, yes. Bill from Philadelphia. Hello. <laughs> All right. So this is on page 105. Communities can be distinguished into two types, which we might call the natural and the intentional. A natural community is one that emerges spontaneously from the natural bonds between people. In concrete experience, the natural community is already given a long with the life world in which we're embedded. We do not form natural communities, but find ourselves immersed in them even from birth, as completely as a fish is immersed in the sea. Our lives are thoroughly interwoven with the natural community from which we can never be separated. Only a floating and porous boundary separates the personal self and the natural community. Intentional communities, in contrast, are formed deliberately. They bring people together under the banner of a shared purpose or common ideals. They usually set up qualifications for membership, such as you have to shave your head and wear robes, <laughs> uh, and are governed by rules and regulations. They're subject to fissures, which actually natural ones are too. Fissure. Hmm? Fissures, not fishers, <laughs> and must ensure that their members remain loyal to the purpose of the group and behave in ways that support its success. Such communities usually also set up boundaries, the transgression of which entails expulsion from their ranks. The principles that govern an intentional community were of particular concern to the Buddha because he was the founder of a monastic order that brought together men and women, and I would say non-binary and trans people too, all beings, all human beings, under a shared commitment to this teaching. The members of the order came from different geographical areas, had been born into different castes, had very different ideas and attitudes, and even spoke different dialects. He was also the guide to a still larger congregation of lay followers spread out over an area that extended roughly from present day Delhi, to West Bengal. Thus, for the Buddha, maintaining the cohesiveness of his community was a critical task, constantly being challenged by the tensions in communal living. So this is a kind of 
uh, another slant on what sometimes people idealize as this perfect harmonious kind of escape from the real world you still have to deal in fact more so right with all the different people and their particular idiosyncrasies and you know because it's a uh, it's not your own family there might be a lot more diversity in these communities a lot more different perspectives different views etc so uh it's natural that there'll be tensions around that. He foresaw that to ensure that his teaching survived intact, it was necessary to lay down rules that would prescribe uniform standards of behavior and define the procedures for conducting communal affairs. In the face of divisive pressures and even rebellion, even Buddhist rebel, he had to preserve harmony and heal conflicts, which erupted several times in the course of his teaching career. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I think it's nice to get into the actual suttas and uh, we can read bits of the intro out at various classes or you can read them out. You, you can read it for yourselves if you have the book. By the way, for those who are new, it's this book by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, which hopefully you've seen online. And if you do want to continue coming, it might be an idea to get one and then you can reflect on it as well in your own time. So we're going to begin... Uh, by getting into the suttas, and the first one is from the Anguttara number 242. So this is very simple, but usually simple is profound. And this is called the shallow and the deep. So when the Buddha uses the word monks here, I'm going to use the word uh, monastics or community, but it's all the same because it does include everybody. And there were obviously more people than just monks there. I, I think, I mean, we don't know for sure, but... You know, bhikkhunis also received the teachings, lay people also received the teachings and became enlightened. So, Monastics or community, there are these two kinds of communities. What two? The shallow community and the deep community. And what is the shallow community? The community in which the monastics, <laughs> it is the monastics, are restless, puffed up, vain, talkative, rambling in their talk, with muddled mindfulness, lacking in clear comprehension, unconcentrated with wandering minds, with loose sense faculties. This is called the shallow community. That already makes us mm. reflect, doesn't it? <laughs> Do we fall into that? <laughs> and what is the deep community? The community in which the monastics are not restless, puffed up, vain, talkative, and rambling in their talk, but have established mindfulness, clearly comprehend, that basically means sati and sampajanya, are concentrated, in other words, they have samadhi to some extent, with one-pointed minds, so that's to quite a deep extent, and restrained sense faculties. This is called deep community. There are these two kinds of communities. Of these two kinds of communities, the deep community is foremost. Hmm. So this is quite something to ponder upon, isn't it? Especially because it's addressed to monastics, I immediately you know, notice certain tendencies where I may be not so clear sometimes in speaking and using more words or rambling more than need be. <laughs> and the other thing that sticks out to me here straight away, actually, is that this reminds me a lot of the sutta called, uh, now, is, is it called Avidya? It is the Avidya sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. And um, that's the one where the Buddha actually talks about some of these things conditioning each other. And he actually starts in that sutta, I think, from the perspective of spiritual friendship, that if you have a spiritual friend, you can develop mindfulness, clear comprehension, etc. You'll have restraint. It's not exactly the same list, but it's very similar. But if you don't have a good friend, if you don't have like good guidance, basically, from either the suttas or from a living teacher, um, <laughs> then yeah you'll be restless you won't be moral basically you'll have bad conduct uh modeled mindfulness which i think is very descriptive 
um, modeled mindfulness means no real clear comprehension. You know, it's hard to be aware of why you're doing what you're doing, of the purpose, of the context, the way to behave properly given a certain situation. And naturally, without that mindfulness and, and wisdom aspect combined with it, um, it'll be very hard to fill the mind. So stillness is always a, a consequence of the practice of wisdom. The right view is the forerunner. And then the right intentions, which are the wisdom aspects of the path. And of course, it directly follows right mindfulness, right samadhi, yeah, directly follows right mindfulness. So these are states of increased clarity and mindfulness, not dull states that are kind of, uh, yeah, they're not just spacing out, you know, or not being aware of what's going on. And uh, here it goes further to say with one pointed minds, which is interesting because that ekagata is, uh, it is one of the descriptions of samadhi that the mind reaches one point or as Ajahn Brahm likes to say, one peak of mind, like the summit of the mind, um, <laughs> where the mind and the object basically merge and become one. And then restrained sense faculties. So of course we need that sense restraint even before we can really establish proper mindfulness. They all feed into one another. But I think it's interesting that it comes last here because perhaps that, you know, having experienced deep samadhi um, and having established a lot of mindfulness, one's sense faculties tend to become a lot more restrained in everyday life. You know, if, if you like the word restrained, I mean, restraint can seem, I think, in the English language, a little bit like constriction or a little bit tight somehow. I quite like what one of my teachers, the word that Ujagara, Venerable Ujagara, he's a French-Canadian monk who uh, ordained in, I think, 1979, a long time ago in Sri Lanka and then lived many years in Sri Lanka and also in Myanmar. And uh, he calls it governing the senses rather than sense restraint, which I think is very nice. Guarding or governing, um, which is like protecting in a sense and, and looking at how you're using your mind so I think that's a little bit more appropriate in terms of the gradual training, which is not about not looking at something or trying not to trying to avoid certain uh, input, but it's more about how we respond and how we attend to the impressions that we receive through the senses. So um, then that sense restraint becomes a really wonderful practice that we can uh, use to guard the mind, to protect the mind in daily life from unwholesome states taking over. So these are the two kind of communities. And it's obvious, isn't it, that of these two, the deep community is foremost. And again, you know, with the Buddha uh, teaching in this way, he's, of course, talking about two polar opposites and no community will ever fall entirely into one or the other. It will always be, you know, a little bit of a mix. And at times it shifts. One community is probably a combination of all of this to some degree. Um, and at times, you know, over here, we talk a lot at times. There's a lot of import. There's a lot of exchange. There's a lot of uh, engagement, especially I'm called to have to engage with the guests and the visitors. And at other times, we're in silence for 15 days, like I have been now. So, um, again, it's not a value judgment, but it's just a kind of encouragement. This is how I understand it, to, to check ourselves and to see how these things maybe connect to bring that mind to a state of clear comprehension, mindfulness, samadhi, and that sense restraint. So um, let's have a look at your uh, <laughs> comments. I got you all your messages. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> um, and Diana's uh, asking a question. In this sutta, is Bhikkhu Bodhi translating community from the word sangha or a different Pali word? Thank you. Ah, interesting. I would imagine he's using the word parissa, but I'm not sure. Because normally community means parissa, and that's why when people say the fourfold sangha, they're actually mistaking what the Buddha said. He never said a fourfold sangha. He said a fourfold community because he only used the word sangha to refer to monastics. Um, and it seems like a kind of small thing, but I actually think it's an important thing. Yeah, assembly, exactly. Community assembly, yeah. Parissa, I think, literally means assembly, so it probably is that word. Um, P-A-R-I-S-A, I think. Um, 
So when he says monks, he probably does say bhikkhus. Um, but basically it means sangha because the sangha included the bhikkhunis. So, and the reason it's important to differentiate community or assembly from sangha is because if we use the word sangha for lay groups, lay groups of meditators, um, it almost obscures the fact that there might be an absence of sangha, of monastic sangha. It's almost like it seems to create a substitute group and, and almost disguise the actual need or meaning of having a monastic sangha. I don't even like to say monastic sangha because it's sangha. I mean, in Asian countries like Sri Lanka or Burma, you would never relate, you would never refer to a lay person as the member of a sangha. You know, sangha means monastics, and there'll be signs in monasteries that say sangha area. It means monastics only area. So I think that's quite important because it also, you know, shows why that the sangha have done something, like they have taken training rules upon themselves you know voluntarily and they have renounced a lot and that is different from a group of people who come together to meditate and you know many are very very sincere and there's no value judgment on that at all but they're not necessarily you know it can refer very loosely just to any group of people that come and meditate from time to time and that can sometimes remove um can kind of obscure the fact that the sangha may not have become established in a certain place yeah. Okay, so someone's asking, please could you remind me of exactly what the one-pointed mind means? Yeah, so to me, the one-pointed mind, a kagata, would mean usually it's a factor of, um, it's one of the jhana factors. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're in the jhana at that point. Like the jhana factors, experiencing the jhana factors doesn't mean you're experiencing a jhana. Um, you can experience different jhana factors without, but but all five have to come together for it to actually um, be termed as a jhana. So ekagata really just means that you're focused on one particular object, but in the state of jhana or deep samadhi, it would mean that the mind and the object have, in a sense, united, like so that there's no duality anymore, like there's just this awareness there. And um, there's no movement in the mind. It depends on the depth of the samadhi, like in the second jhana, according to my teacher. Um, there's absolute stillness. There's like no wobble at all between the object and the mind. It's, it's complete unity. So unity could be one simple way to describe it. What so do you think? I don't know. Anything there's else? no duality. In the there's no object and, and the person watching it. In the first jhana? Yeah. Oh, in, in what is meant by one point. Right, yeah, it's kind of like the duality of an, an observer and the object mm -hmm. disappears. But I think in the first jhana, like, it's not always as stable. So there can still be what Ajahn Brown calls a wobble. So you can go in, but then the mind somehow recedes a little bit and sort of wobbles. So it's kind of not completely unified, but I mean, it's pretty much there, you know, first jhana is a deep stage. And I think when we're talking like this, we're talking about something incredibly subtle. I mean, it's not the kind of duality that most people would consider no, duality. I mean, at you a know, very anyway. deep level. Yeah. yeah, very subtle level, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or have you anything further to ask about that? Okay, I'll go to the next uh, comment. I find it interesting that in worldly life, we often consider a good friend, someone to talk to or even vent to, maybe even to distract us from the painful loneliness that's present with us at the moment. Yeah. Whereas a good spiritual friend is in many cases someone who leads us in staying silent so we can be present with our own mind yeah yeah that could be one way to see the difference yeah um i mean for me certainly spiritual friends can be both you know they can be people not necessarily to vent to or yeah to distract ourselves i mean obviously we're going to do that at some point when we're not enlightened isn't it because unless we fully understood and accepted and made peace with dukkha we're going to still wriggle out of it we're going to say i don't like this loneliness it's too much right now and i don't think we should judge ourselves for that i mean certainly i've phoned my teachers before feeling a bit down feeling lonely feeling like i need to complain and they're just there for me kindly 
And it's true that the silence that they offer, if they do really offer silent listening, it is very healing. And they will, of course, recommend more rest, more solitude, et cetera. So that's true. They're actually someone who leads us into being mm -hmm. present with our own mind. That's true. And Ajahn Brahm has once said to me that real meaning of Kalyanamitta is like befriending yourself, befriending your own mind, so that your mm -hmm. own mind is your Kalyanamitta. Yeah. Did you have yeah. something to say on Kalyanamitta? Oh, well, yeah, no, it's just so different to how we normally think of Friends, we think of friends as someone who, uh, who, uh, uh, what's the word, who makes us feel good about ourselves, mm. and uh, um, uh, yeah, makes me what affirms you, affirms yeah, you, affirms you. you, yeah, quite yeah. often, yeah. yeah. But this is some something very different. That's yeah. true. Yeah, because sometimes we just want like affirmation of even our anger or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like they take sides with yes, us. Kind yes, of thing. it's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I don't like this person. I don't either. That means yeah. we're friends, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, but a real yeah. friend, actually, even if they're not a spiritual friend necessarily, I do think a real genuine friend might sometimes offer feedback and say, "Actually, I don't really want to get into that conversation." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm you know mm -hmm. or they just very gently yeah. sort of oh maybe maybe there's different ways to think of it you know because mm -hmm. my best friend's like that I mean she is a Buddhist it's true she does um identify as a Buddhist but she's so gentle and mm -hmm. <laughs> she's amazing actually and she she just always sees the good in people and she never mm -hmm. ever sort of would criticize mm -hmm. me or I don't think we've ever had an argument in 43 how old mm -hmm. am I 43 years, yeah, because we've been best friends since we were seven, four, 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 I'm not that old. <laughs> anyway, so um, it's mm. quite amazing. Sometimes you can have an amazing friend. I guess it is a spiritual friend too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. Any questions or other comments so far on this part of the discussion or shall we continue? Ready to continue? All right. <laughs> so the next part is called the divided and the harmonious. So again, we get some more kind of general guidelines for what that might mean. So monastics, there are these two kinds of communities. What two? The divided community and the harmonious community. And what is the divided community? The community in which the monks or monastics take to arguing and quarreling and fall into disputes, stabbing each other with piercing words. This is called the divided community. <laughs> Sometimes that's translated as stabbing each other with verbal daggers, which I much prefer because mm. it's so evocative. <laughs> And, you know, those words, when they're sharp and piercing, they're much more painful even than daggers, actually. So I don't think it's too strong. <laughs> you know, piercing. Verbal daggers, I like that. Very uh, evocative description. And what is a harmonious community? The community in which the monastics dwell in concord, harmoniously, without disputes, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with eyes of affection. This is called the harmonious community. These are the two kinds of communities. Of these two kinds of communities, the harmonious community is foremost. Mm -hmm. So again, coming back to the importance of harmony, that's the thread throughout this whole book, you know, the importance of having that harmony as a way to deepen our practice and to express our practice as well. Um, yeah, in this one here, the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi translates viewing each other with eyes of affection. It's the same uh, passage as other translations that say viewing each other with kindly eyes, which I actually prefer because I think affection is a bit more, can have that worldly connotation, but the kindliness to me is more like loving kindness. Um, but it is pure pia chaku i think which does mean loving eyes something like that and pia can be used for love in general um but obviously in this context it's a 
I don't know, maybe it does give some leeway here for affection because these um this description of the community is the same description that the Buddha used to describe the three monks, Venerable Anuruddha, um, Kimbala and Nandia, who lived together in an exemplary manner. And that was the same one, viewing each other with kindly eyes. And they were very close. So there was a kind of precedent in the suttas for people who get on together and are good friends, you know, and maybe do have that sense of affection to actually support each other, live together, choose to live together um, and support one another's practice. And I know that here at the monastery, I would say, I don't know, I think Mary could agree, but we've had uh, lots of times actually with different guests. Shell's been here, Manori's been here. I don't know if Tamali's on the call, but she's been here a while. Well, maybe that was before you were here. But when Erica and Camille and I were on retreat just now, you know, we had this community of three and there was definitely affection there. There was definitely like, you know, not with a clinginess, not with an attachment, but with a kind of affection that actually conduces, it makes it very easy to practice metta. And the more that metta is practiced, the more that kind of genuine care kind of ensues for one another. And um, it just makes for such a good atmosphere for practice. Everybody feels safe as far as you can. You know, we have our conditionings, we have our, we make our mistakes, but, and when you feel safe and at ease like that, it's so much easier to, to really let go, you know, to really allow yourself to, to enjoy and to rest in the meditation, you know, rest your body, first of all, in my case, for at least four days, I just slept so much. It was, it shocked even me that I just couldn't get myself up after lunch sometimes for two hours. It was like, I was dreaming of trying to open my eyes and they were like stuck. <laughs> I was so exhausted. But then after four days, I was so much more rested and felt a sense of well-being. And, um, yeah. It was uh, a very restful retreat. So, uh, yeah, when there's a lack of harmony like that, falling into disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, etc., I mean, then of course, it's probably also going to conduce to restlessness, ramblingness, <laughs> all the other stuff, the wandering minds, obviously, the loose sense faculties. And um, you're not going to be able to get much meditation done. <laughs> You're always going to be trying to resolve, or maybe not, maybe um, inciting more and more argument and division. So then Samadhi is far away. I don't know, I feel like asking you some questions, because it would be nice to bring personal experiences into this. And please don't feel shy, because normally you're quite talkative. We haven't had anyone speak yet um, through the mic. And maybe, I don't know, maybe having two monastics is a bit scary, <laughs> but we're not scary. Hi, Nikki. Nikki want to speak. Yet, Nikki. Unmute. Yeah. So I was trying to work out which is which. My poor menopausal mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, I was interested as you're talking about the communities and about um, the two aspects of it. I guess in some ways it, it makes me... F and I know this isn't true, but my mind says, well, how can a community be always be uh, in a harmonious place? So then I guess it's like bringing in the skillful <laughs> ways of communicating. And because um, I'm quite interested in when it's, you know, when communities start storming and there's some stuff starts to come out. That stuff there, the stuff that um, is not spoken, it's in the shadow. And then it comes, uh, uh, um, when I've lived in communities, it's... Um, so everyone's really nice to start with and then it starts oh they're not they're so nice I think they call it um is it um forming storming and norming there's three stages and then the forming is the plight then there's the storming which most communities stay in or families of relationships and then there's like well it, it um and then being able to actually you know, um, work together in a really healthy way. So I'm always interested in the bit that you get to the harmonious bit. I find that really fascinating. So sometimes it sounds, it makes it sound like it, it, it's a bit wishy-washy. You know, when people think, oh, the harmonious bit is everyone's all right. I don't think that's the case. I, know. I agree, yeah. I know you would. <laughs> I think you can have a superficial harmony, <laughs> which yes. is like you say, usually in the beginning, right? Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, everyone's so nice and 
Yeah, no one's triggered me yet. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say I don't have faith in that. So the bit where you get to the harmonious bit, you can you can feel where people are, are real, but also really kind and harmonious. There is a difference, isn't there? Yeah, I suppose the challenge is to be real and authentic without getting into meanness and nastiness and to be <laughs> very open. I mean, that's the way I do it. I mean, here we do have, we do make mistakes, you know, we do have upset one another sometimes. And I mean, I just, I'm just honest about it. It's like, I feel really bad that I've, I've said the wrong thing or like, you know, this is actually where I'm coming from. But sometimes I just have this conditioning that kind of causes pain for people. And for me, it's like opening myself up opening up my weaknesses or mistakes to other people and um usually I find that that authenticity is quite helpful but I mean we were talking about this today weren't we about how sometimes there's this wish in ourselves not to cause upset or like always to please others and actually it's very unrealistic because life we're going to upset people there's going to be suffering and that's to be embraced I mean the Buddha taught that we need to see the suffering in order to understand it so actually I guess that's yeah you can see that as the storm in the beginning because you're reacting to it and making it more and more stormy but in the end like if you can relate to that wisely I guess that's how you get to the harmony you have the storming but you also have the like relating with the three right intentions mm. so the storming is the result of something that's gone and then the you know the the solution in a way is to create good karma with that so respond to that with kindness and that might just mean opening up to those inner storms in yourself acknowledging it recognizing it forgiving yourself whatever compassion towards it and then the letting go of like I'm right <laughs> and they're wrong and you know needing to kind of prove one's point of view um yeah and then over time maybe we do get a more realistic uh sense of okay people are flawed I'm flawed but we can maybe accept each other and focus on the on the positives as well without denying that there are negatives there. I don't know. Mm. Any thought on that? It's a, I can only see your eye. <laughs> can I only see one of your eyes? Oh. There you go. Come this way. <laughs> there! <laughs> yes, we can see ourselves. Yeah, we can see ourselves. Oh yeah, I don't know if it's my screen then, but thank you. Oh, welcome. Can we come to Leon? I have unmuted Leon. Uh, yeah, so I was just thinking about how in most worldly communities or in most worldly groups, even among people who are friends or who have good intentions, eventually there is this kind of gossip and backbiting and uh, all of these problems that form. And I'm just wondering what... Uh, makes it so that some communities will break apart and, and eventually give way to, to fissures and infighting and others can endure for a long time because the, the Buddhist community and especially the Sangha has endured for uh, 2,500 years. And I wonder if it's, if it's the Vinaya or if it's the dedication to Metta or if it's all the precepts about, uh, you know, not uh, praising self and, bl and blaming others or what allows some communities to endure and be beneficial and what makes others kind of like just uh, break apart after a few months or a few years I think everything that you just said actually probably a whole combination but the two things that stand out to me are like having shared values I think and being committed to those values and then being committed to the precepts to ethical conduct I think that's and probably the honesty part as well being really transparent when you do make mistakes, being humble enough to say so. And that's really important. I don't know. What would you say? Well, the Buddhist community hasn't lasted impeccably for 2,500 years. There's plenty of, um, well, yeah, uh, horrible stuff <laughs> that has happened. It has, it's, yeah, so it, it's not an impeccable yeah. order. And there's, yeah, there has been plenty of dishonesty and breaking of seal and everything that human beings do, but somehow we're still here. So, yeah, I don't know how, but maybe it is that kind of um, general big container of the Vinaya that kind of 
you know, it's like we're human mm. beings, right? Whether we're Buddhist or not Buddhist, whether we're monastics or not, we're all human beings with our own like uh, uh, afflictive emotions. I always try and find a different word to defilements. <laughs> we all have greed, hate, and delusion, greed, aversion, and delusion. So problems are going to happen. But I guess you're right in the sense that there's still that framework is there. But yeah, mm. individual communities are broken mm. apart. And again, I would say it's normally because of the lack of sila, yeah. Like, I mean, for example, in communities where there's been sexual abuse, mm. they normally would break apart. And I think mm. rightly so, because something mm. there is really, really off, especially if that's the leader. And mm. I think better to break apart. I mean, I don't really see how you can reconcile that unless you remove mm. the the person perpetrating mm. that abuse and, and then do a lot of um trauma you know facilitation and and healing and you know really try to look after your community members and help them recover from that um so yeah i think yeah the leadership actually in any particular mini sango is very important as well um yeah should we come to casey casey hi everyone um yeah, so when Nikki was talking about the storming, um, it made me think about um, how in a lot of cases, I think that the lack of unity can come from our own inability to accept uh, people's critiques, even if they're um, correct and valuable to us. We have kind of this knee-jerk reaction that, oh, this is painful, I don't like it, I don't want to listen to it. And I think a lot of conflicts can come from that. Um, and it made me think of a passage that I uh, had read recently in this, this book I'm reading, Great Disciples of the Buddha. Oh, I love that book. Um, which, yes, would recommend very highly. Um, it's just really inspiring to, to hear the stories of all of these, these great disciples. Um, but it just made me think of one interaction uh, that I just read about between the Venerable Mahakasapa and the Venerable Ananda um, that to me was inspiring. So if it's um, okay, I would like to, to share this passage. Um, so it comes at a, a time that, if I recall, uh, the Venerable Ananda had been um, traveling with all of these young, kind of immature, new monks, um, and they'd been going to all of these uh, towns and villages, and the Venerable uh, Mahakasapa was saying that um, that these these young monks they're like not restrained and the lay people will get a bad impression of the monastics and that it's like um, destructive to the community so i'll just um read from from here so the venerable mahakasapa says what are the reasons friend ananda that for the sake of which the blessed one has said that no more than three monks should take their alms meal among families there are three reasons venerable sir it is for restraining ill-behaved persons for the well-being of good monks and out of consideration for the lay families. Then friend Ananda, why do you go on tour with those young new monks whose senses are unrestrained, who are not moderate in eating, not devoted to wakefulness? It seems you behave like one trampling the corn, meaning the, the like young sangha. Um, it seems you destroy the faith of the families. Your following is breaking up, your new starters are falling away. This youngster truly does not know his own measure. And then the journal Ananda uh, says, gray hairs are now on my head, venerable sir. And still we cannot escape being called youngster by the venerable Mahakasapa. Um, and so here, obviously the venerable Mahakasapa is speaking pretty harsh words um, towards venerable Ananda. Um, and I think most of us would react, most of us who were not um, enlightened or not very far along the path would react and say, what you're saying is not true. I was being responsible with the monks, like try to defend the actions that we had taken. And the Venerable Ananda doesn't do that. He just um, kind of says, in a way, like, why do you have to be so harsh? Like, you're still calling me youngster, even though I'm I'm this old. Um, but he has no, no says nothing about um, trying to defend himself because he sees that the criticism is well-founded. Um, and I think that that, when I read that, was just something that was really inspiring that um, could be an example for those of us who are less enlightened than the Venerable Ananda um, in, in accepting criticism, even if it um, brings us a painful vetana, a painful feeling, to look beyond that, that feeling and instead of being reactive to say, um, regardless of how this was said, if the type of speech that was given to me, like the simile of the saw, it doesn't matter how painful the, the speech is, we can we can still endure it. And so to to endure that 
um, perhaps harsh speech and to, to look at the, the content of what is being said, which is, of course, much easier said than done. So, yeah. Yeah, that's lovely. It's also like you made a joke in a way, like, we cannot escape, we, we have grey hairs on our head and still we cannot escape. It's like kind of a humor, humorous response as well. And that's quite, yeah, Ajahn Vam also says, you know, if you're getting upset with each other, there's arguments happening, have fun about it, make a joke of it, because these are your friends, you know, just have a bit of fun, because usually it's because someone else is having a bad day. Of course, in the case of the Venerable Mahagaspa, he was just, it was just his nature. He didn't have any negativity there. It was just his nature to be very direct and kind of somehow severe in in some people's minds but um yeah really good uh, observation because i think if we can just pause and stay equanimous if you like to that negative feeling that comes up in us or that reactivity that comes up in us and just allow that to pass work with that first you know basically do our own work first mm -hmm. sometimes then we're able to return to the advice and realize there's something in that you know mm -hmm. And we can always ask the question, well, is there anything in that that mm. might be true? Mm. And again, as John Brown always says, you know, look at your backside and check out whether there's a tail. If there's no, you know, if someone calls you a dog, I think this is the point. Look at your backside. Have you got a tail? You haven't got a tail, then you're not a dog. <laughs> Which I think is quite nice. Mm. So, yeah. It's hard, though. Mm. I find that hard. If I'm criticised unfairly, it's like... I'm getting better at it because you have to be in my role. You really have to because you're going to get the extremes, you know, you're going to get the mm. oh, complete praise and the complete opposite. And after a while, you realize it really can't be about you because you can't be both people. Mm. <laughs> it's probably the truth is somewhere in between, or maybe the truth is nowhere in that mm. at all. That's just others' perception. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so. Mukund? Yes, hi. Um, hi. Yeah, I had a thought and uh, possibly, you know, slightly tangential, but to me, uh, uh, the interesting thing is one is often in the same community for such long periods of time, whether it's work or family or whatever, that uh, it's hard to sometimes tell the impact it's having on you until you actually transition. And when you move to a different thing and then you say, oh, wow, you know, the energy is so different out here. And uh, so, you know, as I was hearing this, I mean, often, at the, you know, the, the two examples, I think that that's what kind of like struck me as, as being really powerful when you're able to see the impact it's having on you and consciously choose to engage in different ways. Wow. Yeah. Amazing observation. That's really deep, actually, because that just kind of gets at the core of all this, that we are actually very much conditioned by our communities, by our whole entire social environment, and especially the people that we're closest to, our families, you know, going back to childhood as well, but then whoever we're close to, whoever has an impression of us, we're, on us, we're very much influenced by that, and um, that keeping of perspective when you know nothing else, or maybe that learning to see something else by leaving that community for a while and realizing oh actually mm. these negativities don't come up outside that community or these kind of particular patterns do come up and realizing gosh they're conditioned then you know and it is important like you say I love what you said about learning to respond differently we have some ability to like uh, ameliorate those effects of that particular conditioning but also sometimes recognizing that you need to change the conditions um yeah. that so certain conditions might not be healthy and you might thrive better in different ones and uh certainly from my experience with this project always feeling pretty exhausted to be quite frank unless I'm I sleep for three days at the beginning of a retreat um <laughs> you know first day back on the job and my head starts spinning I get exhausted again um sometimes it can be hard to keep my perspective you know and realize actually I'm not always this way or like yeah like now I have concerns that I didn't used to have, but in a different context, I wouldn't. Because otherwise you can feel it's very personal. You can start thinking, is it something in me? But actually anyone in that condition would have a similar response because we are just a product of conditions, right? So I think it's kind of both. It's kind of like we can learn to change the way we respond, but also we can sometimes, we have to change the conditions 
Um, the Buddha did talk about sapaya, which means conducive conditions. And he said that even uh, if you are staying in a place, in a community, in a monastery, or with a teacher, and the unwholesome qualities are increasing, mm. and the wholesome are decreasing, then don't even stay overnight. I mean, that is obviously a kind of, in a serious case, and, you know, I've asked Ajahn about that before, and I felt like a community isn't, I'm just not thriving in a place, and I've given it more like a few years, actually. <laughs> but... um it's quite interesting when you leave and you see, oh, these particular things aren't there now, but these other things might be. It's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, and if I may add, I think the 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 other the related point is, uh, you know, we don't honestly, or I wouldn't necessarily think about how I'm engaging and how much I'm engaging. You engage by default. But having some recognition of the uh, the environment and its effects in some ways makes it easier to say, okay, you know, in this case, I'm really not going to react too much to whatever is being said because it's just not helpful and it's dragging me into a situation, into a frame I wouldn't want to be in or choose to engage more. I mean, either way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really skillful, isn't it, when you can actually put something down? Because the sense of self wants to say, hey, but no, but you got it wrong and you got me wrong. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really de escalates things if you just don't take up the bait. Mm. Yeah. Patience, I think. Patience. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else from the group side? I'll see what the next suit is because we've still got 20 minutes. We might be able to read a little bit more if there's nothing else on that point. Let's have a look. See, we've only got through one page. It's good enough. Right, so we get another um, duality now. <laughs> so it can be related, but different. The inferior and the superior. Do you want to read this one? Oh, okay. Your voice is nice. Make sure my glasses work. <laughs> They're all old ladies. <laughs> Okay. The inferior and the superior. Monks, there are these two kinds of communities. What two? The community of the inferior and the community of the superior. And what is the community of the inferior? Here, in this kind of community, the elder monks are luxurious and lax, leaders in backsliding, discarding the duty of solitude. They do not arouse energy for the attainment of the as yet unattained, for the achievement of the as yet unachieved, for the realization of the as yet unrealized. Those in the next generation follow their example. They too become luxurious and lax, leaders in backsliding, discarding the duty of solitude. They too do not arouse energy for the attainment of the as yet unattained, for the achievement of the as yet unachieved, for the realization of the as yet unrealized. This is called the community of the inferior. And what is the community of the superior? Here, in this kind of community, the elder monks are not luxurious and lax, but discard backsliding and take the lead in solitude. They arouse energy for the attainment of the as yet unattained, for the achievement of the as yet unachieved, for the realization of the as yet unrealized. Those in the next generation follow their example. They too do not become luxurious and lax, but discard backsliding and take the lead in solitude. They too arouse energy for the attainment of the as yet unattained, for the achievement of the as yet unachieved, 
for the realization of the as yet unrealized. This is called the community of the foremost. These are the two kinds of communities. Of these two kinds of communities, the community of the superior is foremost. <laughs> it's so lovely to hear you, Dick. Wow. Your voice was... is beautiful and it just it rings in a similar way mm. to how I imagine it would sound when the Buddha spoke. Mm. I don't know yeah. if anyone else felt that, but I was like, ooh. <laughs> Goosebumps. Mm. <laughs> well, it's very true. That does happen when um when you don't know any better and your 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 leader, and this happens and um, tragically in all institutions and in all institutions that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. The junior monks don't know any different if they if they if they are teachers or, or mm. those who have been ordained for longer behave in um well uh, well just ordinary human like ways mm. they don't know any different and so mm -hmm. it carries on yeah, that's yeah. true. It's, it's very real. It's very it real. is, yeah. It's a bit yeah. like how we said this evening, because we had tea time and uh, lots of dumb conversation. And we're saying, I think that was after you came up, I was mm -hmm. saying to Erica about how fortunate we are mm -hmm. to have teachers who can yeah. explain yeah. things correctly according yeah, to their right. practice, you know, right. and understand the Buddha's teachings and open them up for us. And, just how incredibly blessed I feel when I realize that there is a lot of misunderstanding around even what the Buddha said, right? And of course, mm -hmm. it's not that my understanding is perfect by any means, but just to have some sense that the teachings are becoming clearer and clearer, you know, and to have that feeling of like, wow, this seems to fit, you know, with what my values are, but also with my practice and with what, you know, I hold to be most important in this life. You know, you can have a teacher that wow. brings that out. It's like it's very rare. Yes, yeah, I think rare. it's rare. You can even have good people who yeah. embody humanity's goodness. You know, are what is considered uh, a good human being, but someone who embodies the Dhamma and has yeah, uh, yeah, is very rare. It is very rare. Yeah, yeah. Shall we come to see? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Linda was. Um, I I relate to that. Um, what you just said so much, and I feel like it again kind of ties back to the fact that how conditioned we all are, like how easy it is actually to manipulate us if we don't have any kind of right view. <laughs> and I. I can see that on myself um, throughout my exploration and how, how I was searching for the path before I've actually found it and how easy it was to kind of just go with the flow of someone else's ideas. And, um, and yeah, I also just wanna take the opportunity to thank you for being that teacher for us, like the one who, you know, every week or every time you give a retreat or um, you kind of show us that right direction, even if we feel lost or even if the daily life sometimes, you know, it clouds them <laughs> and we become very um, yeah, ignorant, actually, I think. I mean, I do. I, I can't speak for anyone else, <laughs> anyone else but yeah, um, that's that's like such such a really valuable thing so yeah again thank you so <laughs> so much yeah and yeah just to say that it's not um i know everyone says this but it isn't an individual doing it. it's it's a product of the way mm -hmm. of, you know i've understood the teaching so far and the way that everything that my teachers have tried to you know embody and and sort of teach me 
about and help me to understand you know I think this is the case for all of us and you know we share where we're at we share what we know but um yeah it's also how other people understand it it's what we bring to it as well and uh, yeah it's just such a an amazing thing to have access straight to the teachings you know the Buddha because that's what we can rely on and I think you know myself included falls back into delusion I mean you know, I'm not out of delusion. So, <laughs> you know, my guideline in my compass is the Buddha. So without that, I do think we'd be completely lost. I would be completely lost. I would actually not feel that there's much point to my life, to be honest. That's me personally. I'm not saying there's no point to people's life if they don't have the teachings, because you can do a lot of good in this world. Um, it's kind of an innate quality of the human heart, I think, to be, be giving and to be kind and to try to do good. Um, but certainly you're going to fall into delusion or maybe not ever get out of it uh, much more, you know, easily. And you're going to be much more stuck if you never hear the Buddha's teachings. So, I mean, one of the things I'm so happy about with the Zoom and with the project is actually being able to bring the Buddha's teachings directly to a group of people who are interested in them. I personally, that's why I'm focusing on this more than giving the Dhamma talks at the moment, although I do give retreats. But um, I just think it's amazing when people want to know what the Buddha taught, because there you can trust that that's coming from someone who's seen deeply into things. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. We're so lucky. Now you're going to meet Tamali. Oh, her daughter's called Nayali. Oh, hi, Tamali. Hi. I just really want to um, echo what um, Susie said. So, um, firstly, so lovely. I think I sent the message privately. So lovely to see two bikinis together. I mean, I'm, I just got like this thought, like it must be like this in those days, you know, when there's group of bikinis and, you know, how wonderful we're getting it, experiencing it. So thank you, first of all. And, um, just really wanted to echo what Susie said as well. It's just, um, for instance, for me, it was just when I saw Venerable in um, November, I think. It's just, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not sure if it's delusion, but it's a lot of setback personally for me during lockdown and not being able to practice as much as um, I would have liked or circumstances, but it's just that reset button. So again, being able to have access to the teaching and um, that personal connection, it's just, been, um, also, you mentioned, you know, the experience at the Vihara. So it's just, you know, I can't really put into words um, the amazing experience. So again, uh, it started off with the body, like physically having to rest and realizing how much rest it required. Then just the amazing amount of metta you receive, just the abundance of love you receive, you know, when you go there, it's just, it's so easy for us to generate metta afterwards. It's just, it comes so naturally after, you know, you just have to go there and it's just overflowing. I think it's, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that. So thank you so much. Um, just like Susie said, you so, you know, feel so blessed and privileged, you know to have all this um, access to talks and teachings. Isn't it wonderful when we not only have the access, but we actually really value and, and appreciate it as well. And you know how fortunate you are to have it. I mean, that is really special, I think, you know, and that only really happens for people that I think have got a taste for the Dhamma and are on the path. You know, I think it's a very good sign when that love for the Dhamma starts to arise and fill the heart up. And, you know, you you experience the metta here because you resonate with that. It resonates with the metta that is in you. Um, you know, for people that live around kind of, I mean, some people can live around good people and it doesn't touch them, you know, or some people can live around it all the time. Like if you go to, say, Dhammasara, where you come from, it's kind of all the time. And Bodhinyana, it's all the time. You might not even realize what you have, but then... Mm -hmm when you come into places where play, people are practicing and uh, compared to out there in the world generally, not always, but there can be a difference. Yeah. I think anywhere where people practice. So hopefully that's what a Vihara can offer is that it's a place just for that purpose. And because of that, the kind of whole momentum, the whole kind of, mm, it's like an energy, isn't it? But it's like a certain 
I don't know how you would call it, gravitational pull. I don't know. It's like you get in on something. It's like a kind of current or something that you feel because the general inclination, the general kind of um, intention is to the dhamma. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully this place can become even more of a like power place because we have wonderful bikinis visiting now and <laughs> bikini. Okay. But <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty special to have two. Hmm. Okay. Um, and I go now to Bill's comment because he said he can't talk, he's at work, but what can stink for him is he has an intellectual understanding of what we're discussing, but struggles with the practical application. So in a community to always practice right speech becomes hard. So I say something then hurts people's say something that then hurts people's feelings and causes discomfort in my community and or family. You want to say anything? <laughs> oh, that's all of us. <laughs> yes, we have to not to accept our humanity. Certainly not beating yourself up is a good start. I do that a lot. So I mean You mean beat yourself up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you say the wrong thing. Oh damn, why did I anyway, so uh, I think accepting your humanity, accepting that you are, we are where we are is so important, you know. We know it intellectually, but we don't practice it because um, we can't. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's that basic. Right? Yeah. Mm, yes. So. Two people yeah. have said they can't hear. Is it any better now? Or is it, um, yeah, because this computer does tend oh, to right, 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 right. Yeah, slip in and out it. sometimes. It's the computer. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think. I mean, that's, yeah. That's yeah. Accepting ourselves, and then I guess the forgiveness as well mm. of oneself. Because mm. again, you know, it's um, we're learning. We're just learning. You know, that's why it's called practice. That's why it's called Buddhist practice. That's why the Vinaya, the whole thing, is called a training. Um, you know, we're noticing at first, unfortunately, the suffering of not doing things mm. uh, right, you know, or mm. not being fully as kind as we wish we could be. And it's good to see that that's suffering because it, that can actually also be mm. a positive kind of encouragement to to continue trying to be mm. kind. But that does include being kind to yourself when you make a mistake. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I mean, I know that too. I also beat myself. So oh, yeah. Bill's now speaking. Mm. Hi. Yeah, I got a second. Um, so over time, you continue to practice. Does it get better? I mean, I've been doing this for on and off for 20 years. I'm more on, on now. But does it get, do you, have you, have, with your experience, have you found it, have you found that it has been easier to practice that, right speech you and things? Well, uh, uh, I, I would say um, not that I uh, it becomes easier, but I realize I don't have to take myself so seriously. <laughs> I guess it's the insight that you see. It's not that it becomes easier, but you have insights that... Um, you stop, yeah, taking your thoughts seriously. You don't believe yourself so much. And, <laughs> and it just kind of, I, the, the, it just kind of becomes more, less of a ball of, you know, me walking the path. Just, uh, the, just un, 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 undoes itself. Mm. Yeah, you could say it's the wisdom. For me, wisdom, understanding the uh, non-self, really, understanding non-self 
helps helps things become easier the same thing yeah i mean that's my personal experience mm. not taking my thoughts seriously <laughs> most useful teaching <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> oh <laughs> shall we come to sean i don't know if that's what hi can you hear me yeah i think i'm off yeah. mute yeah yeah hi yeah no um i agree with a lot of comments here of course uh we're very lucky and i've never really come across this access to the sitters i didn't really know much about them so for me that's a real blessing and being able to discuss this with and the real life experiences that really helps and what bill said i was just laughing i was thinking well it just sounds just like me um so i i i'm sure other people thought the same thing but i can only talk for myself um one thing I would say, though, a couple of things would be, first of all, I've noticed that sometimes because I'm now more aware, in some ways I suffer more, whereas before I could maybe block it out or distract myself. So that's one thing. But what I've noticed is I am aware, which leads to more skillful speech, uh, whereas before maybe I was doing things and I didn't even realise the and so I would say that I guess and I can't remember who said this whether it was uh Yuvan uh, Chanda or Ajahn Brahm or Brahmali but said you know it's a slow it's sort of like a almost like a compounding thing right you you build and so maybe at first it's for example noticing and then one time you don't say that thing or you restrain yourself and so yeah, but it's also really interesting to hear about uh, don't be so hard on yourself uh, as well. <laughs> I think, yeah, I can, I can be pretty hard on myself and it's it's sometimes difficult to have that perspective, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. yeah, and we so easily kind of see the mistakes and don't notice the changes the, for the best, mm. for the better. Mm. You know, we can so, especially if they're ingrained habits, it's like I'm doing that again and then it seems like you're always doing it, but actually... Yeah. It's just that you've kind of created some kind of identity or issue out of it. So you notice it more and you're not as quickly noticing all the goodness that you're developing. And I do think it's, yeah, I have said before quite a few times that, you know, sometimes it's just you realise you haven't done it as much. You know, it's that one time that you didn't or it's like, OK, I got angry only three times this month and before it was four times, you know. <laughs> so it's not like all of a sudden you're going to see a massive mm. difference. But I think over time it is there. And especially if Bill is now, you know, practicing more in the last few years than he, than you were before there, then um, I do think it has effects. It's just they might not manifest in the way we expect them to. So don't trust it too much because I do believe it works. It works. You know, you wouldn't still be doing it if it didn't. Mm. <laughs> should we just read that last comment and then i think we need to do the closing words who's going to do that today is it shell anyway i'll invite you in two sex or minori maybe all right i forget if this is ajahn chara ajahn Samedo, but i believe they said something to the effect that a majority of the path is knowing what you need to do and failing to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Presumably the focus being on the effort, not necessarily always succeeding. Yeah, super. Yeah. The focus being on the constantly trying to redirect ourselves back to right intention, I would say. Like, I mean, you could call that right effort. Yeah. Like constantly just, yeah, trying to re reorient ourselves back to the path, back to the path. Because before you're on the path, you know, you're probably hardly ever doing that. And it seems like more suffering when you start to see what you're doing. But it's only suffering that was there anyway that you weren't aware of before. And it's not actually more mm. suffering. It's just that you're becoming aware. You have to become aware of the suffering in order to figure out a way to understand it and then eventually um, see through it, see what's creating it, you know, see the causes for it. So, yeah, super. All right. So I think we've come to a full hour, but um, we just had a few words to say at the end from Minori today. So. If you can just give a couple more minutes, that would be great. Yeah, so today's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis, as you know, uh, in the spirit of generosity. Any contribution you are able to make is very gratefully received and will help the sport 
Venerable Chanda's physical needs, the day-to-day -day running of our Vihara in Oxford, and the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards a full bhikkhuni ordination. And uh, also, if you're capable, you can provide a food dana to Venerable by visiting the Vihara. And also, there are several more ways to get involved. You can, um, we have some WhatsApp groups to provide food um, if there's no booking made or to volunteer to one of work that you are you are capable of. So if you can get involved in that kind of ways, please contact team at anukampa.org. Um, and okay. if you are keen in providing food or weekly supermarket delivery, these, these groups are called um, Anukampa Hands, in ready, Hands at the Ready, Aha and Afa, Anukampa Food at the Ready. So please contact team at anukampaproject.org if you want to get involved in any way or if you want to volunteer the, on a retreat or any talk. We've got Ajahn Brahmali's uh, retreats and talks coming. So there's a lot of ways to get volunteered and get into the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manoi, and thank you to everyone here. Can I just add actually that we also um, are gonna start uh, giving the opportunity for people to send a shopping delivery. We ideally probably look to get one once a week if at all possible so we'll either contact the uh the whatsapp group to say if there's a need for that or you can contact the team at again and offer to do a grocery shop maybe uh on a monday or or once a week anyway i mean obviously not the same person but there's an opportunity to give dana from wherever you are so different different ways and um thank you to everybody is there anything else i need to say there are some upcoming well tomorrow morning there's a meta meditation at 9 a.m uk time for an hour and then i'm doing a couple of day retreats in march so one's in person in london uh you can look on our website and one's online the following week i think it's something like the 19th and then the 26th of march so anyway and lots of other things too like i'm actually teaching a retreat in norway co-leading with um a janito in april and i think we've put it on our facebook page i'll put it in the newsletter eventually um but i'm not planning to write one straight away um yeah you can find details i'm sure if you look up uh retreat norway ajan nito ben chanda you can find it and that's like a seven day retreat so thank you for being here and shall we unmute everyone and then we can all uh say goodbye you can see so many people here who are about to come and visit like sean's gonna come i said that we're always giving you my office for couple of days and then uh you'll meet tamale and shell or calm and Nori and casey or calm and yeah <laughs> hopefully more of your come in due course so we can uh yeah we can unmute you and we can all wave goodbye if you wish